Help us to learn from you. Father God, I ask that your word will penetrate deep, not only into our minds, but into our souls, into our hearts. That you will draw us, Lord, closer to you. So God, help us to truly worship you in spirit and in truth as we listen to your word. As we learn, Lord, how better to live our lives. In Christ's name we pray. You know, as I said, falling asleep in church is a is a common thing, actually. It's, it's one of those things that uh, I sometimes will look out and be talking and I'll notice there will be one or two people that are just going, you know. And, and I can take that personally, but I know it's just a common thing in life. Uh, there's, a, there's an old joke uh, about a man who was constantly falling asleep in church, always falling asleep in church. And so the pastor was getting really annoyed about it. And so he, he talked to the deacon. And he said, okay, I want you to, this Sunday, I want you to sit behind him. And when he begins to fall asleep, I want you to kind of nudge him. You know, wake him up. The guy agreed. And so the following Sunday, sure enough, the man sits down. And as soon as the pastor begins to speak, he begins to drop off. He begins to drop off. And so the deacon notices it. And so he nudges him a little bit. But pretty soon the man's dropping off again. He's starting to so it nudges him a little bit harder. And again, hit him a little bit harder. And again, hit him a little harder. Finally, the deacon is so upset about this guy constantly falling asleep, he just hits him, knocks him out of the pew, and onto the ground. Now, instead of getting upset, though, the man turns to the deacon and says, Next time, hit me harder. I can still hear him preaching. <laughs> you know, that's not that far from the truth, though. Back in the old days, back in uh, of American history, in Puritan New England, they had a guy called the Tithing Man. And the Tithing Man was probably the most feared of all the people in Puritan society. Because his job was pretty varied, but he was... Imagine a police officer on steroids. That's sort of what the tithing man was. The tithing man, for example, made sure that you paid your tithe. Everybody have your checks or cash to pay the tithe today? The tithing man would make sure you did. You had to pay a certain percentage, the 10%, you know, or you got into trouble. In fact, the tithing man had such authority that if you didn't pay your tithe, he could actually put you in the stocks. Even put you sometimes in jail. That was how much authority he had. And he was in charge of other things. He was in charge of making sure that kids learn their Bible. You know, you guys don't know your Bible. Ooh, the tithing man's going to get you. The tithing man made sure that all the Puritan rules basically were enforced. George Washington was once traveling on a road to another town and he encountered a tithing man who stopped him and said, why are you traveling on the Sabbath? Why are you riding your horse on the Sabbath? And he says, well, you know, the road's rough and I'm trying to be able to get to another town so that I can actually spend the Sabbath the way it should be spent. And that that, the tithing man let him go, but he wouldn't have otherwise. That's how much power these guys had. But one of the most famous things about tithing men is in church. You see, you would maybe have a tendency to fall asleep. Many of these people would fall asleep because they get tired, long sermons, etc. But the tithing man would make sure that you stayed awake. And how he did it is he had this big long pole. And at one end was kind of a knob oftentimes, you know, a hard thing. The other end was like feathers or maybe a a uh, piece of cloth, animal fur. And so if one of the kids decided to get, you know, a little squirrely in church, he would reach out with his pole and go pop right on the top of your head. 
Now, if the man fell asleep, same thing. Pop! Right on top of your head. But a woman, a woman is different, right? He'd reverse the pole and he'd gently use the feather to kind of tickle her. You know, to wake her up a little bit. Or, or you know, maybe nudge her with the fur a little bit. You, know, you didn't hit a woman over the top of the head. But the fact is, is that the tithing man had this power because sleeping in church, falling asleep at the wrong place in the wrong time, was not a good idea. Our memory verse, Ephesians 5.14, says this. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, commentators believe, because they're trying to figure out where this quote came from, they believe it was an ancient hymn. The idea of the fact that we need to be wakeful. We need to be aware of what's going on. We need to not be sleepers. But if you're like me, I love to sleep. How many of you like to sleep? Yeah, sleeping is good, man. I love to sleep. And, and I love to take naps. Back when I was a kid, man, my parents, my mom tried to get me to take a nap. No, 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 no. Now, you suggest me taking a nap, I'm going, okay. Yeah, I like naps. I love to sleep. Sleeping is great, but not if you're falling asleep in the wrong way in time. Not if you're falling asleep in the wrong way in time. My wife and I have this thing, uh, an expression that we use with each other is called hitting the wall. It means that we've been doing something mentally exhausting, physically exhausting, something like that, and we hit a wall, and we just have to stop. We're like, I've got to go lie down, I've got to go whatever. With her, she doesn't necessarily sleep. With me, I, I go take a nap because I've hit the wall. But if you hit the wall at the wrong time, it can be bad, right? Imagine you're driving and you hit a wall. Ooh, that can be bad. There's a condition called narcolepsy, which I'm always scared to death of. Because narcolepsy is a medical condition where the person can't help themselves. They just fall asleep. They just, you know, wherever they are. Can you imagine a pilot with narcolepsy? Yes, we're at 5,000 feet. Wow, that would be terrible. Disasters can occur when you fall asleep at the wrong time. Did anybody ever hear the term asleep the switch? Let me give you an example. It's an American idiom. It actually, it's a, I think it's a, just an English idiom. And I sometimes teach it when I'm teaching English. But, for instance, a person can say, oh, we had an English test on Friday. And I missed it, you know. I must have been asleep at the switch when the teacher told us about it. Where that comes from is in the old days, before we had computers to control them, trains had to have switches on them that were controlled by people. You know, the train track that runs here through Edmond, right? That you get stopped at all the time there, you know, on, on um, 15th Street, et cetera. That track runs through Oklahoma City, maybe I don't know where all it goes. But sometimes you see trains going one direction. Sometimes you see trains going the other direction. What keeps them from hitting each other? Well, there are switches. There are like spurs on the line so that if a train's coming this way and a train's coming that way, that will, there's this little switch will move, this little thing will move that redirects the train another way around so they don't hit each other. Used to be in the old days, they had a guy who was in charge of that. He had a timetable and everything. He knew when the trains were coming and he would sit there in this in a little box and he would manually flip the switch. But it could be a boring job. Can you imagine what happened and did happen when the man fell asleep at the switch? A disaster, right? So you might be thinking, okay, Pastor John, I get it. Falling asleep at the wrong place, wrong time, bad idea. What does this have to do with what we're studying? Interestingly enough, in the Bible, in our study in Acts, we see a time 
where a young man fell asleep at the switch. He fell asleep at the wrong place in the wrong time. Look at Acts 20, verse 7 through 12. It says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Now, I'm not really sure if they were just comforted because the young man was alive or because Paul finally stopped speaking. But, you know, probably a little bit of both. I mean, this is a long time, right? He started out when they began to break bread. In other words, they got down and had a meal. And then he kept talking. And then went on talking all the way through the night until daylight. I mean, that's a long marathon session of, of preaching. Right? You know, I wonder how his voice did in all of that. And, you know, quite frankly, you can hardly blame Eutychus, Eutychus for falling asleep, can you? And something like that. How many of you would fall asleep? I mean, I'm only going to preach two or three hours today. But can you imagine that kind of marathon session? Can you imagine that? I mean, I, I would have a hard time conceiving of that. You know, I, I think in some ways fidget spinners may be divinely inspired. Because fidget spinners, quite frankly, help keep you awake, at least keep me awake. I have a problem. I have a problem staying awake when someone else is talking. I don't care if it's a conversation that we're having. I don't care if I'm sitting in a lecture and I'm at school or listening to a sermon. If I am just sitting and trying to concentrate on what's being said, I end up dozing. And so I need something to do. I need something to... When I was a kid, I used to doodle so that I would stay awake during a, when the teacher was talking. In a sermon, you know, you guys get passed out the notes. Feel free to take notes. Feel free to doodle. I understand. Because it's really difficult sometimes to stay awake. When I'm teaching or something online, I have a fidget spinner or something like that that I can do so that I can really concentrate and stay awake. You know, it's important to be able to focus. And I'm sure that what Paul was saying was important. But he, he may not have been a riveting speaker. He may have. I don't really know. And we can look at someone like Eutychus and we can say, okay, maybe his age. The Bible says he was a young man. In the Greek, that translates basically to he was maybe 7 years old to 16 years old. Sometime, some place in there. The length of time, it was long. And the setting, they didn't have AC. They didn't have a really comfortable situation. It was probably hot. It was stuffy. The lamps were, were going, so you probably in the air there was a lot of smoke, you know, or the fumes, etc. He, he had found himself an open window. They didn't have panes of glass or anything like that. So he's sitting in this open window trying to keep cool, trying to listen to Paul. Oh man, fatigue got the best of him. He didn't have the fidget spin. And he just fell out. He just fell asleep. So I can relate to that. And you probably you can relate to that. Of how difficult it would be. Lots of factors. But here's a spiritual application. Physically, it can be hard to stay awake. Yes. But you and I have a real danger of being asleep spiritually. Of being asleep spiritually. The thing is, is that we must remain spiritually 
away. Now, let me ask you another personal question. Last week I asked you how many of you shower and how many of you take a bath. Okay. How many of you brush your teeth on a regular basis? You're all going to admit to that, aren't you? <laughs> Once a day? Twice a day? Three times a day? How many of you put on deodorant? It's a good plan. Thank you very much. We all appreciate that. How many of you shower at least once a day? Okay? Sometimes twice a day, etc. You know, in the old days, many people were so superstitious of taking baths and, and getting the body wet, they thought it was unhealthy, that they would actually go for like a year without taking a bath. And even then, they were afraid, you know, the water really coming in direct contact with their skin. So many of them would take a bath in their clothes. Can you imagine? Ah, ah, ah. Right? But we, we were really concerned with our personal hygiene. We're concerned with our diet sometimes. We're concerned with our physical exercise. We're concerned about all these kinds of things. How concerned are we, though? about our spiritual fitness, our spiritual hygiene, our spiritual health. We're really concerned about the physical. But what about the spiritual? How much concentration, how much time do we spend on that? You know, if you let yourself get run down physically, what happens? You get sick, right? I mean, if you, if you get to the point that you're not getting enough sleep, you're not taking care of your body, you're not eating right, etc., then when a virus comes, or so, I mean, it can zap you because you're not physically able to resist it. Same thing happens on a spiritual level. When you allow yourself spiritually to get to the point where you're weak, you're starving, you're not taking care of that very essential part, then you can easily be attacked. You can be easily overwhelmed. It can leave us defenseless against our enemy. Now you say, well, who is the enemy? Look at 1 Peter 5.8. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The devil's out there. He's not just some kind of cartoon guy in a red red suit with a you know, forked tail and a pitchfork. The devil is real. And the devil is out there, the enemy, trying to get you to fall, trying to keep you off track, trying to keep you away from your relationship with Christ. There's a battle going on for our souls. There is a battle going on in the spiritual realm that is, is constantly fighting around us. We don't see it. We don't recognize it, but it's there. And it is always trying to pull us in one direction or the other. And when we are defenseless, spiritually defenseless against our enemy, it's really easy to be picked off. You ever see those documentaries, the nature documentaries uh, in Africa or, you know, someplace where you, you have maybe a, a bunch of animals that are herding together and are prowling around them are the lions, right? Or, or some other kind of uh, predator. And you don't see the lion just jumping into the middle of the herd and finding the leader, finding the strong ones, right? Instead, you watch them. And they circle around and they wait. And they look for the young. They look for the sick. They look for the weak. The stragglers. They're kind of off on the side. And those are the ones they take. Those are the ones they kill. Luke doesn't mention others falling asleep despite the length of going. Just you do this. Is it coincidence? It's not necessarily a coincidence. Because, you know, these people were used to this kind of thing. 
our culture, I mean, if someone speaks longer than just, you know, maybe 45 minutes or so, we're, we're out. But in this culture, in this culture, it was common to get together and listen to someone for a very long period of time. Uh, even when we were in Africa, and I've told you this before, even in Africa, you know, we would, uh, there would be like local services that I would go to and I would be scheduled to preach. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I just go there and preach and we're done, right? No, we're not done. Because there would be, there would be music and then announcements or whatever and I would speak and then when I'm done, there's more music and another preacher. And then more music and then another preacher. And, and the services would last a long time. Because it was a big deal. Out in the village areas, sometimes people would walk for hours just to get there for this event. Just to spend that time listening and absorbing the Word of God. And so these people are there. These elders are probably trained themselves to be able to stay awake. But Eutychus, he's young. He's weak. And he's easily picked off. We can relate to that. But the thing is, is that spiritual fatigue like this can cause dangerous drifting. When we allow ourselves to get weak spiritually, when we allow ourselves to not be where we are with God spiritually in the right way, we can be easily picked off. Now, looking out at this congregation, most of you are in pretty good shape. You're not as out of shape as I am. When I was younger and more in shape, I could exercise for, and I could, I could go and go and go and things were okay. Now, man, I walk to the refrigerator, I get winded. You know, I get tired. Easily. I'm trying to work on that, by the way. You can pray for me on that. I'm trying to work on that. But I get winded easily because I'm out of shape. Alan talks to me about playing racquetball. I used to play racquetball. I was good. I don't think I'd last five seconds right now, Alan, playing racquetball with you in my current condition. You'd probably have to have a stretcher there to carry me off, you know. Um, but I enjoy it. But I'm just not in good, as good a shape as I used to be. You know, marathoners, people are able to, to stay in shape. People are able to, to play racquetball for long times. People, it takes practice. It takes work, hard work. For you to be able to thrive spiritually, guess what? It takes work, hard work. We can allow ourselves to stay spiritually flabby. We can do that. And we can allow our state, ourselves to stay spiritually unfit. How? We neglect to work on our relationship with God. How much time do you spend with God? A day. Think about it. How much time do you spend in prayer a day? How much time do you spend reading the Bible a day? Or even thinking about God a day? You know, to get your body in shape requires discipline. You discipline your body. You work on what you eat. You work on, you know, with your exercise. It, it takes effort. The same way with spirituality. About two, three years ago, we had a series on the spiritual disciplines. Do you remember that, anybody? We talked about the different spiritual disciplines. And Richard Foster has identified about 12 different spiritual disciplines, and we went through those. And they're kind of the 12 are divided into categories. First of all, the first four deal with the inward man. Your relationship between God and yourself. The second four deal a little bit more outward. 
dealing with how you interact with individuals. And the third four is really on a corporate level. How you deal with the world around you, the body of Christ, especially around you, in a spiritual sense, a spiritual level. Now, I realize you've slept since then. So I'm going to go back through these really quickly and, and talk about them to kind of remind you of what these disciplines are. If you have your notes, write these down. First of all, prayer. We talk a lot about it. But prayer is essential. Because prayer is communicating with God. It's going to the head office. It's making sure you know exactly what you need to be doing in life. Where you need to be. It's, it's talking to the person who loves you. Who, who gave up everything. Gave up his son for you. It's talking to that most important person in your life. God, not, not some concept out there, not some, you know, woo, 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 whatever. A very personal, very intimate, very real person, God, who loves you, who created you, who knows everything about you. He knows your past, present, and future. And he's the one we need to be communicating with. He's the one we need to be connecting with. The second spiritual discipline that we need to really be practicing is meditation. And I'm not talking the transcendental stuff, you know, oh, nothing like that. I would fall asleep doing that, okay? It's just the way I am. Now, meditation, though, is heavy focus, heavy thinking. Thinking about God, thinking about the different aspects of God and His will. It could be a specific verse. Maybe you find a, not probably not Jesus wept, but you, you find a particular verse in the Bible maybe and you focus on that, you meditate on it. Well, what is God trying to reveal to me? What's He trying to say? Or it may be an aspect like grace. What, a, what am I supposed to do with that, with grace? What does that mean in my life? What is God trying to reveal to me about how I need to show grace and how I'm a recipient of grace or love or mercy. To really spend some time thinking about it. You can even take your fidget spinner if you want to. But focusing, meditating on that. What is God trying to teach me through this verse, or this concept, this, this thing? Etc. The third thing is fasting. Now this is one that we don't do a lot. You know? Because, you know, it just is uncomfortable. And sometimes we do it in the wrong way. Some people fast because they think it's a good diet plan. Oh yeah, I need to fast so I can lose weight. That's not what fasting is all about. You know, several things are necessary to control us in life. Right? We have to have a certain amount of sleep. Okay? We have to have air to breathe. But probably the most in-your-face one is we have to eat. We have a physical need to eat and drink. The discipline of fasting, what it teaches us is that we need to even give up that basic thing that controls us. We need to put it aside. We need to have the discipline to set it aside for a while. And instead, focus on the one who gives us the food in the first place. The one who is enabling us to have something to drink in the first place. Who designed our bodies to have the need. We're putting that aside. We're, we're disciplining ourselves for a, a period of time. Just to focus. Just to focus on God. And let Him be in control and not the food be in control. The fourth thing that we look at is study. The spiritual discipline of study. In other words, taking very, a uh, very disciplined approach to, to learning Scripture. To reading the Bible. And maybe not just that. To studying how, how God has worked in nature. Or how God has worked through 
uh, the physical sciences. As long as the focus is on God and how He is working. Obviously, Scripture is primary, but it can also move into other things as God leads, as God reveals, as we study what God has done in the bigger picture. Number five is simplicity. Simplicity. You know, we worry about a lot of things, don't we? Am I going to pass this test? Am I going to have enough money this month to pay the bills? What am I going to eat for lunch? What am I going to wear for that big job interview? What am I going to... All of this kind of stuff. And, and Jesus talks about that. He says, you know, you worry about all this kind of stuff. But the most important thing is to do what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all this other stuff is going to be added to you. That's the most important thing. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Focus on this. Seek God's kingdom first. And don't be so caught up with these other things. The next one is submission. Submission, basically placing God's will above ours. Submitting what God has us do. The next one is solitude. Getting away. Withdrawing from the world to spend time with God. Jesus did it, didn't he? Jesus got away. Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. How many times do you take time out of your busy schedule just to get away and spend time with God? All of us are busy, right? Or if we're not busy, we fill our time with other things like, you know, playing on your phone or watching a Netflix video or whatever. We always want to fill our time with something. How often do we fill our time with just getting away from it? And spending time with God. Getting away from the noise, the hustle, the bustle, getting away from our friends, getting away from our families. It, maybe even putting yourself in your closet and spending time with God. It's all in solitude. It's important. It is a spiritual discipline. All of these, by the way, you can look at scripture verses, they all talk about it. service. Reaching out to those around us. You see your brother in need. Do you just walk on or do you serve them? Service is a spiritual discipline. It is part of keeping ourselves awake to what's going on around us. During the, in the last four we have confession. And this one is tough. Basically realizing that we're sinners and stating that in front of other people. Being willing to go to your friends, being willing to stand up, willing to stand up in front of a church or a meeting and say, look, I have messed up. I have been living my life this way. This is wrong of me. And I want to apologize to you guys. And I want to ask you to pray for me. Pray for me. Wow, that's tough. But it is part of of the Christian walk. Of being that vulnerable. Being willing to admit that you're not superhuman. Being willing to ask for prayer. Being willing to confess and ask for forgiveness. I mean, some of us, we've heard other people around us, right? And we just think, ah, well, no big deal, right? No. Confess your sins before others. That's what the Bible talks about. We need to be willing to do that. Corporate. Guidance is number 10. Guidance means not only giving somebody guidance, but also receiving guidance. Being willing to learn. Being willing to listen. Being willing, when necessary, yes, to guide others. Celebration is number 11. Celebration is Taking joy in what God has done. A spirit of thankfulness. A spirit of gratitude. 
I mean, it's very easy for us, isn't it, to go through life complaining. I don't have enough of this. I don't have enough of that. Rah, 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 rah. But what God wants from us, too, is to look at all He's done for us. You'll be a lot happier, I guarantee you, if you're counting your blessings rather than counting the things you don't have. We spend time actually focusing on the joys of what God has done for us. I mean, think about it. Everyone in this room, you're pretty healthy. Everyone in this room, you have clothes to wear. Everyone in this room, you probably came here in a nice car, or at least a car that got you here. You were able to have a good breakfast if you wanted it. You're going to go home or go out to eat and have a good lunch. You're going to, oh, we're going to have snack later. We have been so blessed. Are we truly grateful for that? You have an education. You have job opportunities. Are we truly grateful? And do we give... Give thanks to the one who made that possible. Or do we somehow think it's because of we deserve it? We don't. God gave that to us. And when we celebrate that, we celebrate that. That is a spiritual discipline. And it keeps us alive. It keeps us awake and alert. Because we are able to say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. And the final one, is worship. And I don't talk and I don't mean just coming up here on a Sunday morning and standing up and singing. That is one very, very, very small aspect of worship. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is an attitude. Worship is where you come before God and you just like, ah, I want to connect with Him. And I want to bring the others along with me. I want us all to come into His presence and experience Him. And how wonderful He is. And when we can have that spiritual sense, we feel alive. And we're awake. And when we practice all of those 12 different disciplines, and we really work on them, then we're no longer weak and defenseless. And when the enemy starts to prowl around looking to take someone down, it won't be us because we are stronger and stronger. Does that mean we'll never be attacked by the enemy? Of course not. But it means that through God's strength, we'll be better able to resist. We're better able to get through it because He has given us the strength. Physical trainers tell you to push through the fatigue, to do one more pull-up, etc., to build your body up. But too many times we give in to the spiritual fatigue and we stop. It's just too hard to pray. It's just too hard to do this. It's too hard to do that. And when the world's lures and temptations come, when we're spiritually weak, we have no resistance. We just drift away. And as we get weaker in our faith, what happens? Doubts creep in, right? We're more likely to compr compromise our morals, our values, because we haven't been working our spiritual body. We haven't been keeping it strong. When we allow it to get weak, we can easily be led astray. What if Christ came back today? What if, what, what time is it? It's, it's 10 10. At 10 11, Christ comes back. Are you spiritually ready? Are you spiritually ready for that? Hey man, we've got 45 seconds now. Are you spiritually ready for if Christ came back today? Would you be where you need to be? 
1 Thessalonians 5, 25, 2 through 6 says this. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Say this with me. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and so sober. Let us be awake and sober. Paul's talking about spiritual awakeness. Being awake, being alive, having trained that spiritual side of yourselves to be ready for when this comes. Not being spiritually ready, awake and alert is a huge problem many people face. I'd be willing to bet that probably the majority of the people that you know have this issue. That they're not spiritually ready. The Bible, when Jesus is telling the parable of the ten virgins, and you may remember how that goes, is the ten virgins are, virgins are, are waiting for the bridegroom to come call them to the wedding ceremony. And they have the, this, this oil in their lamps. But some of them, some of them didn't prepare. Some of them didn't prepare. There were five of them that had the oil and five of them didn't. And so when suddenly the bridegroom came and woke them up, they're like, oh, we need to go. But they realized they didn't have oil. They said, oh, well, give us some of yours, the, the ones who didn't have any. He said, give us some of yours. And they said, I, we can't, we might run out. Go buy some. And so the five foolish versions, they went out to try to buy oil, but it was too late by the time they came back with it. And the bridegroom said, you know, when they knocked on the door to get in, he says, I don't know. And that parable is talking about the fact that those who really are filled with the Spirit, they know God. They have accepted Christ. They're prepared for that experience. When, when Christ comes back, they'll be ready to go with Him into that, that wonderful marriage of the, of the church with the bride. As church of the bride with, with the groom, with, with Christ. But the others, they may have been in church, they may have been around the virgins, whatever, they're not prepared. And unfortunately, they're going to knock on the door and Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. And there's so many people like that around us. They're not prepared. Which type are you? Are you prepared? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Or are you just one of the foolish virgins who are just here? waiting for that day to come, and when it comes, you're going to say, well, no, now I'll make my decision. Now I'll follow God. And it's too late. Even some believers are not completely ready because we've allowed ourselves to get weak and flabby. Look carefully at Jesus' words in Revelation 16, 15. He says, look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed. Clothed in this sense is really talking about clothed in, the, in righteousness, etc. So as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. If he came today, would we be awake or would we be asleep? Well, thankfully, He forgives and He revives and He restores us, right? He forgives and He revives and He restores. You know, when we, when we um, play computer games, many of you play computer games, and in those computer games, if you die, what happens? You respawn, right? 
You play League of Legends or whatever, you know, you get killed. Oh, wow. Who cares? You spawn again and you get back into the game. You're restored. Yeah? Endless lives. Over and over and over again. Right? Imagine if you're playing a game, there's no restoration. Uh oh. That's it. <laughs> you play one time, you get killed, it's all over. Yeah. The game probably wouldn't be that popular anymore. The thing is, is, we as Christians, we can be forgiven. We can be revived. We can be restored. Uh, that's the next point, by the way. You know? Yeah. We can be forgiven. We can be revived. We can be restored. But it's not automatic. It's not just like, oh, we get killed and we go back to the beginning. That's not the way it works. We don't get all our hit points back. We have to actually seek it. We actually have to come to God. And we have to come before Him and, and with our emptiness and our brokenness. But the good news, look at 1 John 1 9. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we come before Him, we confess He will forgive us. He will revive us. He will restore us. Yay! <laughs> Once forgiven, forgiven, though, we must seek to be revived. We must seek to be restored. We can't just return to cheating. We can't just get back into that same old pattern over and over because we end up sliding deeper. We must instead continually move, continually work spiritually to get back to where we need to be. But the good news, as I said, is He will restore us. 1 Peter 5, 10 through 11. And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. He's the only one who can restore us. He's the only one who can truly forgive us, revive us, and restore us. But we must turn to Him. So our question today is this. Are you drifting off spiritually? Are you drifting off spiritually? Maybe you've been drifting off for a long time. Maybe you're asleep. Don't no, stay there. Neglecting the disciplines? Are you letting the world rule your life? You know, we're not little kings and queens. We will serve either God or the devil. We don't have a choice. I mean, the devil can come in many disguises. He can say, oh, it's myself. <coughs> you can believe, well, I'm not going to serve any God. I'm an independent man. I live, I live my own life. Guess what? That's a lie. Because if you're not serving God, you're serving the other side. No matter what you call it. Because we were born for service. We were born. We were designed to serve God. And if we don't do that, we serve the other side. You have a choice. And this devil that's out there, remember, he prays on the weak ones. So are you falling asleep in your Christian walk? Wakey, wakey. Wake up. Father God, I thank you for your reminder that we need to be spiritually awake. That we need to serve you, Lord. That we need not to neglect our spiritual side. We spend so much time on our physical, Lord. But not as much time as we should. Really spending time on our, our spiritual side, of getting to know you better, of learning to practice the spiritual disciplines that you outline in Scripture. 
Help us not to be weak and defenseless. Help us not to be spiritual eutychuses that fall to our deaths. Father, help us be strong in Christ. Amen. So we are going to enter into a time of tithes and offerings.